school libraries are the great equalizer for all children, regardless of social economic status, and how many or few books a child has at home. The San Jose State School of Information is the largest MLS provider in the nation and the world, and we are committed to being an unyielding and strong ally in helping strengthen school libraries in California and nationally. Tonight is the second of three school library summits we're sponsoring. We'll also be hosting a National Library 2.0 mini conference globally in the fall. I want to especially welcome all of our attendees, but especially school board members and school leaders. And thank you for taking the time to join us at this important event. As a cognitive psychologist, instructional technologist, and leader in emerging technologies, it is with great confidence that I say both reading literacy and now digital literacy for students, teachers, and parents are essential for success, which makes the role of school libraries even more important today and in the future. We're honored to have some of California's foremost school library experts and leaders with us today. And so let me turn it over to Dr. David Leutcher, who will help moderate the event. David? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Chow. You know, uh, as we uh, guide you through this whole change in uh, libraries into learning commons and on into innovation centers, you know, we, we realize that the idea of change is just in, incredible in all of our lives. And next slide. And uh, it's really interesting. Uh, we, we expect, I think, uh, lots of professionals in our lives to keep up and change as the world changes. And uh, for example, our doctors and dentists and uh, tax consultants and so many people in our lives, we, we expect them to be the best of the best. And uh, for example, we want them to keep up. I was once in a, a car with a, with a doctor who said, uh, I don't bother with keeping up on the new uh, uh, findings in medicine. I am more uh, comfortable just doing what I, I do well. And I thought, you know, if I were if I were in your office today, I would just uh, uh, grab my things and run run out the door. <laughs> but uh, if we look back at George Washington, for example, his doctor, uh, you know, uh, bled him and was a major cause in his death, and his dentist equipped him with uh, wooden teeth. And <laughs> we think, well, we hope our doctors and dentists can do a little better than that. But in the area of libraries, uh, you've got uh, four pictures uh, on your screen. On the left is uh, the library I remember from my high school. Uh, uh, the librarian attended study hall, and, she, and in one end of the study hall was the library, and it was a bunch of lawyer bookcases. And she would allow two students to come up into the, the, the library, and we could peer through the glass doors. And if we really, really, really wanted one, we could say, I want the blue one, the, the blue one with the spine. And so she would raise the door very carefully, hoping maybe we wouldn't want to take it off because otherwise she'd have to shelve it. And then I remember a box over in the corner that had lots of drawers. And I said to her, what is this thing? And she says, keep your hands off. She said, that's the card catalog, she says. And and I, <laughs> I spent all my time filing it and I don't want you to mess it up. Well, I hope you had a, a, a much better experience in the libraries of your childhood. But, uh, you know, for many, many years, we've had um, uh, school libraries have been uh, uh, just full of uh, uh, bookshelves with lots of books that circulate. And, uh, and that was the main function of the library to be a storage and retrieval center. And, uh, uh, Unhappily, there's still a, a lot of those around, even in California. Uh, but during the 1960s, uh, everyone was discovering audiovisual materials. And so those came into the libraries. And maybe you remember the 16 millimeter projector or, or the phonograph records or the sound film strips. Boy, they were, they were just wonderful. Uh, uh, but um, toward the uh, end of the, uh, well, at the beginning of the millennium 2000, you know, uh, all of a sudden uh, 
the internet happened and, uh, and, and microcomputers. And suddenly we, we, we began, began to emerge into a whole new world. And in the lower right-hand corner, uh, we've even uh, uh, gone into what we call uh, innovation centers or innovation labs in some schools. And so uh, what we, uh, we think about the transition of uh, uh, the uh, school library along a continuum, just like we expect our doctors and our lawyers and, and things to, and the, to stay up uh, to date. Uh, next slide. And so um, the, probably the easiest way I can uh, use to explain uh, the difference between a library that's uh, just kind of books that are circulating and a learning commons is to do what uh, I had to do. I wrote a book uh, in the last, uh, in the 1990s, it was very popular. It was called the Taxonomies of the School Library uh, Program. And um, when the internet uh, dawned on the world, uh, uh, I thought, well, I need to do a third edition. And so I started to, to read through it and all of a sudden it, it crashed in my head. You know, nothing I had said in the past Made made a bit of sense in a, a totally changed world, so I got together with a couple of really great uh, 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 teacher librarians in Canada, and we came up with the idea of the Learning Commons. And what it did is it forced us to rethink every single thing we'd ever learned about libraries and and flip those notions. And so I'd like to uh, introduce that idea to to you as a way of helping uh, everyone understand this major change in, in uh, that we advocate in school libraries. So for example, if you were a student or a teacher and you uh, walked into uh, the Learning Commons, what would you expect to find? Well, in the Learning Commons, I could read a book but I could also, in its many formats now, but I, I could also write a book in its many forms and formats and share that, my writing out to everyone. I could watch a video, but I could also create a video. And we all know that these, this generation that's, uh, that's uh, hooked on, on videos of all kinds of uh, they are most action, uh, anxious to share with everyone they know uh, videos, and so they love to do that. Uh, I could, um, I could uh, play a game in the Learning Commons, but I could also create a brand new one to share with others. I could, I, I could uh, use a computer program, but I could also use artificial intelligence to create a whole new uh, program that might serve, uh, you know, and, and, and make a major difference in the world. Uh, I, could, um, I, I could obey the rules of the Learning Commons, or I could help revamp the rules of the Learning Commons. You know, I could, if I were a teacher, I could, I could use lessons that I've used in the past but now in the Learning Commons, I could pair, uh, partner with a teacher librarian to create some exciting new learning experiences. Um, if, if, I were, uh, uh, if I walked into the physical part of the Learning Commons, I could also realize that there could be a virtual Learning Commons that could be uh, available 24 seven, and it would be a community of of teachers, parents, students, and the librarians uh, investigating, learning, and learning to learn within that uh, a whole different social environment rather than just a one-way street of here's some things to click. Let's move to the next slide. So uh, 
Another way to think about the, the change and one of the most valuable things teacher librarians add to this, this uh, change to learning commons is uh, how they partner with, with teachers uh, in the creation of learning experiences. Uh, yes, we are concerned about major scores that are coming in, in literature, I mean, in reading and mathematics, and we support those. For example, in reading, you know, as, as children uh, start to study animals, what we would want to do is to try to build wide reading in many formats as possible while they're uh, studying animals rather than just reading a little passage in the textbook and listening to the teacher talk. Uh, and of course, as they would, if they read widely, they would build background knowledge uh, uh, that would help them in passing whatever test is going to come their way. Um, and, and another thing that teacher librarians could do is choice, choice, choice for kids. For example, my grandson came to me a couple of weeks ago and said, oh, that I am reading this series of books and the library has volume 22, but they've missed library uh, volume 21. And I said, well, just come right over my computer and we'll just see what Amazon can help with. And, you know, I was thinking, you know, I'm a grandpa uh, who can do that, but there's so many children who don't have the wherewithal or, uh, to, to be able to, to read as much as they want to read in, uh, you know, in any topics uh, that they're interested in, and that's going to make a difference. Of course, in math, uh, I have a, a senior in high school grandson, and he said, you know, I'm in an advanced math class and my teacher really is not very good at explaining differential equations or whatever we're studying. And most of the class is failing. And I was thinking, you know, the teacher librarian could, could work with that teacher and, and we could list the major, the major skills that have to be mastered. And the teacher librarian would work with that teacher to provide 10 ways Here's the resources uh, you could do. And uh, I could do it in Spanish. I could do it by video. I could do it in a uh, blog by reading blogs. I could do uh, guiding tutorials. In any way, there would be ten ways to to help every learner uh, progress in mastering what what is required. And of course, uh, so that's what we can do for the standardized test scores. But then there's a lot of other things that we teacher librarians are great at doing. You know, they can, uh, they love to partner with, uh, with, with teachers on, on high uh, uh, end technologies. And we're most interested in, in digital uh, literacy and with, uh, with all of these uh, uh, things coming, how do we behave for example, in many different formats and, and things coming at all of us. And uh, we, we, we choose to blend in rather than teach a, a class in digital citizenship, for example, and the teacher uh, teaching a topic, we, we, we like to join those two things together so that uh, the, uh, they experience in real time you know what it is like to be a digital citizen, for example, and and another concern that teacher librarians have is 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 the whole idea of what what information can we trust in today's world? I mean, we're all hit with this plethora of just uh, messages of all kinds and types. And, and so the teacher librarian can fold into a learning experience that's happening in social studies or science or literature or whatever. Uh, this idea of literature st stick model, where we, we, we do six tests uh, of information competence. So of any kind of information coming into me, I could ask who is saying what to me for what reason, for what gain, 
through what channel and with what evidence. And if, if I get a red light on any one of those things, I don't let that information stick in my brain, I flush it. But if I give it a green light, I, I let it stick and I learn from it. And if I give it a yellow light, I just haven't quite decided yet. So that is a really important skill that I wanna push in as a teacher librarian into whatever the uh, learning experience is going on in the classroom. And uh, so uh, what, what we're, we're trying to say is that uh, it's something like building a chocolate chip cookie. And you know, if, um, if uh, teacher librarians would like to be the chocolate chips, okay? So if the teacher brings the kids in for, and teens in for a learning experience, and we get one chance to teach them in 15 minutes some databases <laughs> and send them back to the classroom and we never see them again, it's kind of like building a chocolate chip cookie with one, one, one chocolate chip. And we'd like that cookie to be just full of, of chocolate chips, uh, of things that that uh, both teachers and librarians uh, could uh, put together. I did some research uh, on, uh, on classroom teachers and teacher librarians a few years ago. And I asked the teachers, uh, you know, at the end of a, think of a, a learning experience that you've just finished, uh, what percentage of the students uh, uh, met or exceeded your expectations? And the answer, came back, uh, over 200 teachers, I think, um, about half of the class. In other words, if you're in, uh, into education, it's the bell curve. About half of the students succeed. And then I ask uh, teacher uh, librarians when they when they teamed with those, when they teamed with teachers, uh, take that learning experience and and tell me, what percentage of the students met or exceeded both of your expectations? And the answers came back 70 to 100%. Now, in my book, that is a huge gain. In other words, what's happening when these, uh, when the li uh, teacher librarian starts at the beginning and carries through as a partner, clear through the learning experience to the end, what happens? That means that, and they combine, that means that our chocolate chip cookie is absolutely delicious. And we always say that two heads are better than one. But I also say that, you know, you take one and one and you add them together, you get three because the 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 the, uh, the total is greater than the sum of its parts, so that two heads truly are greater than one. Let's go to the next slide. Um, let's see. Um, if you want to know a lot more about this whole idea of learning commons, there's this wonderful website that. Uh, over the last year has been growing. My students and I have been working on it. You can find it at www.alivelibrary.info, um, or you can take your camera right now and, and, and uh, take a picture of the QR code and it'll take you there. And there's just a lot of things to work with uh, and conversation starters. Uh, for uh, uh, board members, administrators, and uh, teacher librarians to get the conversation started. Where are we? Are we keeping up? Are we doing the best we can, et cetera? Next slide. You know, uh, there is a wonderful uh, eminent researcher in libraries. His name is Keith Lance. I, he lives in Colorado, and he is about to release in September a major, major study on the uh, situation of, of uh, teacher credential teacher librarians all over the country. 
And I ask him as a personal favor to uh, to uh, take a, a quick look at California and see how we're doing. And uh, we are challenged, I'll tell you. Uh, uh, so we have the the worst uh, uh, um, uh, number of teacher librarians to students ratio in the in the nation except for one and that's Idaho so uh so that's a, a major negative for all of us to think about and in in trying to give opportunity to every single learner that comes under our our, our direction uh but um you know uh but I was thinking that maybe tonight instead of listening to me more that you would like to meet some real great uh, California teacher librarians and and see what they're trying to do to to make a huge difference in their schools. And as we got volunteers ready to do this, the, the problem is they do so much. And we we'd say to them, well, you're going to have three minutes. And so you're going to have to just kind of uh, tell us one one or two big major things that you do. And so we're going to open this uh, wonderful showcase to all of you. And our first presenter is uh, 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 Lisa Bishop. Lisa, go ahead. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy that you're here. Um, it's very thrilling to have all of you part of this symposium. Thanks for organizing it, Dr. Lorcher, and all of you at San Jose State University and all of our directors of school information science programs. You are fantastic. Thank you for supporting all of us. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, this is a few years ago. Yeah, I just feel like all of us need to rock our libraries when we get one. We're so lucky um, in California, especially that we just need to rock it as, as, as fast as we can and as best as we can and to support one another while we're doing it because we're kind of like a one person band. Next slide, thanks. And this is why we do what we do. This photograph is one of my very favorites from some of my first years as a school librarian at, at Flynn Elementary in San Francisco. Um, getting the students to love learning and love the library and love reading this is why we do what we do, but it's not only just a love of reading, it's a love of a community and helping each other and supporting one another. Um, so I just love this picture so much. Next slide. Um, I'm now a middle school teacher librarian. I've had an elementary uh, school library and now a middle school. And I feel like we are able to help uh, create leaders in our, in our libraries. And that's what I've been trying to do um, since I became a teacher librarian is create ways that students be can become leaders in the variety of ways in our schools. Next slide. Yeah, uh, another reason why I do what I do. So many students, a lot of these students at my first school were kids who didn't wanna be in the classroom, didn't wanna stay in the classroom. They were our hallway walkers, like we all have our hallway walkers. So we started a mouse squad and guess what? They were in the library all the time. They wanted to read more, they wanted to help and they, become, they became leaders of technology. Next slide. Next slide. Um, I'm part of a reading task force right now at our middle school. We're, have, we're seeing a lot of students coming to us from the elementary grades, not able to read, not able to read nearly any single syllable words. Some of them very few syllable, one syllable words. And so many students are walking the hallways um, because the school is not grabbing them in ways that they need. Um, the library is doing that, but we're only one person. So we're doing reading, we're writing, we're, we're you know doing wellness, we're doing suicide prevention, we're doing stop motion films, we're making slime and lip balm at lunch, uh, we're bringing in guest speakers. Um, but the variety of ways that we can, can promote reading, the pajama parties that we had when I was an elementary librarian, it was so much fun. We had, oh gosh, over a hundred people in the library with the grandmothers, the grandfathers, the parents, the kids in their pajamas and reading their own stories. And 
just we have to consider new ways to promote reading. Thanks. Next slide. Oops, I think we went too fast, but there were three slides that we went through really quickly. If you can go you back. Got, you got 30 seconds, Lisa. We're oh, over our three you. minutes. Oh, thank you. Do you uh, want to do a closing statement? Yeah. Here's what I'd like to say to everybody. Support school libraries and librarians as much as possible. Um, we create bang for the buck. So we are worth every single dollar um, and then some um, for the state of California. I really am, I, if you want me to be a cheerleader anywhere in your, in your area, I will come and I will cheer for more school librarians. Thanks for listening today. Next up is Jordan. Okay. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Jordan Maddox. Um, I'm in my first year as a teacher librarian at Madera South High School in Madera, California. Uh, before this, I was a classroom teacher for 12 years, a history teacher at middle and high school levels, uh, but made the pivot to uh, being a teacher librarian this year. I wanna share about two areas that I brought to the teacher librarian world uh, that come from my background. One is community organizing and the other is uh, working in digital spaces. Uh, so one of the first things that we decided to do was start to offer ESL and citizenship classes, which is something I've done at libraries um, all over California uh, throughout my career. Um, and we offer them twice a week. Uh, myself and another support staff teaches them. Uh, our community, Madera, is there's a lot of migrant farm workers. Uh, they call it Little Oaxaca of the Central Valley. And so there's lots of folks that need uh, language support and help. And we wanted to offer that gratis to them so that they could get the support they needed and also build connections with families. Uh, I think Rachel's gonna try and push play on this and so we'll see if it works. Um, okay, so we don't have sound, uh, but what this is is a video of an event that we put on uh, in keeping with this idea of library as community support. Um, and so this is our school gymnasium. Um, and we did a Thanksgiving event where we gave 1200 meals away gifts, gift cards. Um, so those are my students right there that are passing out food. Uh, that's my associate Martine dressed as Santa Claus. Um, it was a great event um, and it's kind of all in keeping with this general uh, scope of supporting families through the library. Next slide. Um, so three other things that I wanted to highlight. Uh, one on the left-hand side, and this is all in the kind of digital uh, space, um, is uh, book recommendations. A lot of students don't know what to read next. They read one book and they like it, and they're like, well, that's the end of the my reading career. Um, so we have a QR code on there. Students scan it, send it in, and then it gets sent to my phone, and then I just literally text back. Um, it, my text message will just go right to an email that sends to them a book recommendation. We also started a podcast called Book Stories. Um, it's on Apple and Spotify and Google Podcasts. You can look it up. Um, and basically, it's me interviewing staff, teachers, students, even sometimes parents about their favorite books, why they love reading, their reading life, all those kinds of things, um, just so we can model what we want our students to aspire to. And then last but not least, uh, we have a YouTube channel uh, that covers, you know, uh, basically uh, areas that teachers need help with, with, whether it's remediation or connecting them to college skills. And so we created a YouTube channel and update it three times a week. Thank you. Next up is Amy. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Amy Linden. Um, I am a high school teacher librarian. I'm at El Dorado High School in Placerville, which is midway between Sacramento and Lake Tahoe. Um, it is a suburban and rural district, and I've been teaching for uh, almost 30 years and a teacher librarian for most of those. Um, at my school, I, I'm pretty typical, do the usual teacher librarian things, a lot of research, a lot of uh, citation practice with noodle tools or MLA format, APA format, um, citations. I do a lot of um, free reading, book talks. Um, and several years ago, um, I was introduced to um, the concept of breakout EDU, which is breakout rooms um, in doing them in your library. Um, and I feel like kids these days are so technology oriented. They don't get enough experiences with things that are kinesthetic and tactile. And I really like what 
these kind of experiences give to them and they can be adapted across the curriculum. So I started out with a set from Breakout EDU, but soon uh, after figured out that they did not offer uh, all of the topics that my teachers really wanted to delve into with uh, puzzling and, and trying to do these. So what happens is um, usually there's a box, they have to try to break into it. There are five usually different locks on the box. And each one of those locks is an opportunity for a different kind of puzzle pathway. Um, and so kids have to work together. There's a lot of collaboration. They're usually in teams of three to six kids. Um, and I have usually about six boxes going at once. Um, and so there's either one or two or three steps to each of those puzzles that they have to find out. And a lot of it has codes involved, uh, ciphers, um, and uh, I think it's really great for kids to, you know, learn how Morse code works, or um, I have uh, different types of like a Caesar ciphers with different alphabet codes and things that they have to figure out. So um, I started to investigate how I could do them beyond uh, breakout edu and so I, I now write my own games uh, especially for teachers when they need them so I have them on a variety of things I've done them for AP uh, calculus I've done them for you know history and uh, next slide will I think fill in that um, so the teacher comes with the idea and science social science uh, just about whatever they want to do, uh, I will write a course for them uh, or a, uh, write a, uh, something to go with their course specifically. And it's really fun. As you can see the kids there, I think they really enjoy the opportunity to, um, to touch things, to figure things out, uh, you know, that they actually can kind of tinker with. And um, they get up and around and are moving, trying to put clues together from around the room. So that's just one way we practice critical thinking and HOTS is what we call higher order thinking skills. So synthesis um, and analysis and um, just putting those puzzle pieces together to come up with a combination. And that's pretty much all it. One of the things, thanks for listening. This is one of the pictures. This is pretty, pretty funny if you wanted to go back there. Um, I did this one this week, which is one that I designed a couple of years ago on the Cold War. And the funny thing is that I have one phone line um, that's an old landline in my library and uh, have been able to hook up a rotary dial phone to it. And that is the best all year to try to get these kids to figure out that phone. Thank you for listening. Leah, you're up. Hello, my name is Leah Lattice, and I'm the teacher librarian at Long Beach Wilson High School. I hold master's degrees and an admin credential, and this is my 19th year managing our library. Wilson is a diverse campus with roughly 3,600 students and 150 teachers that our library supports. We have solidified ourselves as a hub on campus by providing a warm and welcoming environment for all of our students that focuses on literacy, academics, and social and emotional well-being. Our library is vibrant and busy and constantly changing to provide for whatever needs arise, and we usually pull in a couple hundred kids a day who both study and relax. We also ske schedule uh, class instruction, provide library programming, and serve as a facility for testing, meetings, events, you name it. It's truly pretty magical. Next slide. One of the many things I do is have a creative and collaborative relationship with our SPED department, um, which includes 12% of our student population. Although I've always welcomed and worked with the department, it was really during COVID that a stronger bond was forged and a deeper collaboration began. It started with Zooming in on Fridays to provide some variety to instruction and evolved into lessons in which I curated resources for the teachers and took the learning beyond the classroom. So our collaboration has since continued with regular instruction and lessons, and we fondly refer to it as a SPED Lib collab. This is a photo of our moderate, severe, mixed grade, functional ELA class holding their pa passports that they created during our recent lesson, Where in the World? Next slide, please. 
So when we collaborate, we use the Encyclopedia Britannica electronic database, which is part of our suite of California State Library digital resources. And a while back, I realized, you know, our SPET kids, they can do this too. And what a great innovative tool for the teachers. So it's interactive, differentiates, adds variety, and has a variety of features to also support our ELLs and those with hearing and vision challenges. It teaches library research skills and gives access to additional resources that are credible and safe, all while supporting the SPED curriculum that often lacks in content, resources, and rigor. Basically, it elevates both learning and instruction. So in this lesson, students were introduced to countries and their slides were linked to the encyclopedia database entry for each site. And depending on the teacher's preference and student need, we would read the entry together or use the text-to-speech feature. Then we would pull out sentences to write. And for your reference, um, both of the links are live uh, for the lesson and for the database entry on the Great Wall. So although the database has been a powerful tool in providing and adapting instruction and learning, the greater force has really been the collaboration and enriched relationship between the library and the SPED department. Um, because of it, SPED students and staff feel even more supported and connected, which aligns with our district, school, and library goals of excellence and equity, of valuing diversity, and supporting the personal and intellectual success of every student every day. Thank you. Next up, Nancy. Hello, everyone. I'm at Mission Education Center. I've been there since January of this year. I was previously at another school, so you can change that. Uh, thank you. So I'm at Mission Education Center. It's a newcomer school. Um, there's pre-K, TK, up to fifth grade, and they stay for one year. Slide, next slide. So this is an interesting school. It's their Spanish speakers only. They've come from um, all different parts of Latin America, all the way from Colombia, South America. We have one from Portugal that speaks Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, many from Brazil, Honduras, Central America. Um, anyway, they come and they don't know any English. They may know thank you, yes and no, and that's about it. They're placed in, this, in the classroom according to their age. Many of our students in fourth grade have never been to school, and it's not because they didn't want to. The pandemic hit when they were probably in kinder or first grade. And then you put in the traveling. That's another reason why they weren't in school. All of our teachers here are bilingual. You can switch the... Um, there's an array of, 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 of um, challenges that they face. The majority of them, they've been interrupted they, or they're sporadic or they haven't been in school. Um, they come with little English. Not, uh, 100 or the 98 percent are significantly, significantly below grade level. Um, like I say here, we place them by grade, whether they've been to school or not. Um, they've experienced significant uh, trauma, uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute. 93 of our students are enrolled, have been been on, uh, have come through our to the past the border unaccompanied. And some of them have crossed up to seven borders. 97% um, are Hispanic. There, we have one child that's Mexican and Chinese. A lot of tardiness. We, we're in a kind of an affluent, affluent neighborhood in San Francisco. Our, our students come from the Tenderloin. They come from the, the Bayview, the Hunter's Point, and they either take the bus or, they're, they're, um, or they um, come on, on the school bus. Next slide. So... Myself, for myself, I always say that my kids come, my students come first. I am both an educator and a learner. I'm very reflective with my practice. That's a daily uh, reflection. It's a weekly reflection. It's a yearly reflection. And then my personal growth is my responsibility. Next slide, please. So how do I achieve and aspire to all of the above or better yet, where do I start? And this is about advocacy. Next slide, please. So... In the first two weeks, like I say, I was I was moved from one school to another because someone um, had to leave. So I took over another school and I'm there. And um, within two weeks, I have to do all of this, meet the teachers, write letters to families, do some student surveys before I can even do anything. I want it. I need just need, I need to observe, put my, my looking glasses on. Um, create expectations with classroom teachers and students and myself, uh, create tentative schedules because in a, in a, as much as we want to have a flex, a flexible schedule, 
Um, in elementary, it's not, it's almost impossible. So I always make sure that I have two hours of a flexible time. It's usually between 1130 and 130. Those are the times that I consider my flexible time. Um, and then I always get myself on a committee. Um, what do I quickly assess as well is the, the library, um, collection, the furniture, what's available, what kind of money, what kind of technology there is. Next slide. And you have 30 seconds, Nancy, to close up. Already? Yikes. You're actually at four minutes already. I am? Yep. Okay. So Thank if you want to close up, that'd be so great. I have to identify my needs. And so what I did in this school, I went to their, um, uh, what their vision was, and it was to promote a very, um, to, um, to provide different perspectives and cultural voices. Next slide. But what I found in the library was I didn't see that. I didn't see that at all. So I was able to get the, the, the money that we got from our district was from my school was 4,000. When I shared what I had with a principal and the admin and the other in, in the SSC, I was able to get another, a secure another $8,000. You can go to the next slide. So what I did was I had to make sure I had to identify my stakeholders. You can go to the next slide because I already said that one. Um, and this is admission education center. Again, I was there since January. I just went to the principal and I said, look, these are all our needs. And so this is what we did. And I was able to get everything but the, the bookcases, which they said they would purchase in next fall. But everything else we got. Thank you. Gabrielle, it's your turn. Hi, everyone. I'm Gabriella, and uh, I am a middle school teacher librarian at Paul Revere Middle School in Los Angeles Unified. And we had a one book, one school with new kid. Next slide. Okay. Um, so I was able to get 11 out of our 15 English language arts teachers to read new kids. So it wasn't quite one school, but we were almost there. So approximately 80% of my students read the book. This was also inclusive because SPED students, because it's a graphic novel, SPED students felt that it was accessible for them. And they were included. In fact, the one of our SPED classes liked it so much, they went out and bought Class Act. And that is going to be their second book for uh, this semester. So that was really uh, gratifying. We had Jerry Craft visit, uh, do a virtual visit. And we had about 100% participation from our homeroom teachers. So 80% read the book and about 95 were able to view the presentation. Um, and also with graphic novels, using it in the classroom validated graphic novels as actual literature and doesn't dismiss it because many students gravitate towards graphic novels. And I think that is a really important uh, skill and tool for teachers to utilize more than they do. Next slide. And so how I got teacher buy-in, I mean, all of you know, some teachers really hold on to, you know, the book they've read the last 30 years, and they're not going to change that and read a new book. So first, I created the lesson plan for teachers with grade level standards. I made it as easy as possible for them. I included formative assessments, a summative assessment, um, how to use Canva, um, made it again, as simple as I possibly could, how many chapters to read every day so that I could just pass it on to them and they could start with their classes. Um, with Hoopla. So if you're unfamiliar, it's like Libby or Overdrive, except you are able to have unlimited copies. So it's great for a class to read a book or novel together. And uh, Los Angeles Unified has collaborated with Los Angeles Public Library. So all of our students receive a digital library card. With that, I went into English classes and gave out their student success cards to kids and then got them onto Hoopla. So again, made it as easy as possible for the teachers so there wasn't any excuse for them not to participate. Uh, we held our virtual visit during homeroom uh, and I had worked with admin to change our homeroom to accommodate a longer homeroom and then shorten the other classes by five minutes. And that was a conscious effort so that again, it wasn't going to impact your normal day schedule. It's not like periods two to five are now going to be behind or ahead because period one had a virtual visit. It was all during homeroom. Everyone could participate. Um, and then, like I said, 80% of our students read the book and then they were excited to hear the author. And so when I looked on the Zoom to see who was not attending, what teachers were not on, I was able to go to their classrooms and say, oh, why aren't you on? They thought it was optional. Well, how many of you kids read the book? Bless them, 90% raised their hands. And the teacher said, oops, okay, I guess I'll get on. It's a bigger deal than I thought. I'm like, yes, it is. And then finally, uh, our booster club, I had to do a little finagling and convincing them to fund Jerry Craft as he was 
a rather expensive uh, author to do even a virtual visit. Uh, luckily, they were able to do so. And uh, I waited until Donors Choose had a match offer. So you are able to do uh, virtual author visits through Donors Choose. And with that match offer, it was essentially half price. So our parents were very happy with that. And the kids were happy to have read the book and then have him come. And thank you so much. You can slip the next slide. It's just permission. Nina, you're up. Hello. I have heard so many great ideas today. So it's really exciting to be here. And um, thanks to all the presenters before me. I, I can't wait to run away with your ideas. Um, so I am the coordinator of career uh, coordinator of libraries first career education and outreach. There are 15 school libraries in our uh, in our school district that I help oversee. And kind of like my title suggests, libraries really are the bridge, the intersection, the crossroads of so many important things. And I think we've heard that over and over and over again today. In my district, they are really valued. They are considered important. And our media coordinators sit on a lot of adoption committees, curriculum council board. We're kind of really used as advisories um, to the district when they're making big decisions. So that's it's an exciting position to be in, to have a have, to be in a role where libraries are valued the way they are in my school district. Um, so I, I'm gonna really, and I know three minutes, and I'm gonna go quick, but I'm gonna quickly explore our advances when it comes to curriculum support, our literacy efforts, and our outreach. As far as curriculum support, you'll see I threw up a slide here. Um, all of these are little things we've done. There's been a lot of, of different things. But what I want to emphasize here is that libraries provide support to our non-content specific areas. So we think about content as a teacher. You're like, they have basal readers for math, for science, for social science, for language arts. But they don't really get the same type of support for curriculum that's supposed to be integrated um, integrated into what they're doing. So that's tech, that's social emotional learning, that's diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, digital citizenship. You've heard these words over and over again today, but what we haven't emphasized is how difficult it is to teach for teachers to constantly be thinking not only of what they're teaching, but also of how to integrate all of these great important things into what they're doing. And I think that's where we shine as librarians. We come in and we show them ways to do that. Um, our, our, the other part of curriculum support, and again, this is not new news, but that public library connection, when you think of a goal to create lifelong learners, you have to think about that vertical articulation piece. And that begins TK pre-reading all the way up through adult life. So we've created this partnership where a student's ID that goes along with them from kindergarten up um, allows them digital access to the resources that are available within their community. But we've taken that a step further where we've started to make, I have a portion of my job that's connected to CTE, which creates these partnerships with our local community colleges where we start understanding the tools and databases that they're using, whether they're ProQuest or Gale or whatever they have, and start influencing our public libraries to buy those. So we're creating like a community of competency, really, because these kids have been using the same tools and you're not seeing that trade in and trade out. All right, I need to go faster. I'm sorry. So this, this slide really quickly shows a framework. The next slide, literacy support. Um, I, I wanted to mention the fun, the fun of libraries, the maker spaces. We're doing that. We're doing the hands-on activities, the Ozobots, the Bebots, the green screens, the breakouts, the art games, the contests, the things that make our students enter into the curriculum. And we have gone a step further with our organization of shelf, shelves. We've genrefied based on our standards. So we have social justice standards, um, teaching for tolerance, that are identity, diversity, equity, and inclusion. We call them idea labs. And idea labs are areas that our kids can walk into and look and find those books that are already pre-tagged like a librarian would with that genre of identity. Okay, and then community support. Nobody makes community partnerships better than librarians. Um, we have all these virtual, virtual authors that have come into our schools. We have partnered with our local water district. They're currently for Earth Day doing succulent planting. They're paying for assemblies for our schools. Um, we've partnered with 
Cal, uh, Cal State, they're doing owl palette dissections with us. All of this organization of all of this program is coming through our libraries. Core literature and guidance support. Um, we have noticed that a lot of our uh, core literature right now is changing. It's being challenged. We have to step up and be leaders in all of this fight for the freedom to read, et cetera. But we have gone uh, one step further. About 30 seconds, guidance. Tina. Thank you, with guidance on that. And then I'm gonna end, before 30 seconds, these are just pictures. I mean, I said a lot of words, but pictures speak a thousand and our kids are smiling and happy. Thank you. All right, Lisa. Hi, I'm Lisa Chibi, and I um, was a teacher librarian in LA Unified, and now I'm uh, the education librarian at CSUN. And so research um, as a verb is a unit, a foundational unit in research that I co-created with Dr. Susan Norton, an English teacher at Verdugo Hills High School. And this is a low stakes, high engagement, 10 lesson unit designed to build foundational skills in research and allow students to practice just those skills. The final assessment, you can go ahead to the next slide. The final assessment is a presentation of everything that they've done practicing research. They compile um, all the work that they did in those 10 classes. Um, and it is assessed using a mastery grading, uh, learning and grading model. So this first slide in the presentation, so this is all student work. Uh, this is one of the sample student presentations. In the first slide, they present what they did in the first two lessons, which covered teaching students how to use the question formulation technique to build research questions, choose topics, brainstorm questions, and identify priority questions and the criteria that, uh, based on criteria that they created. And then from those questions, they identify their keywords. The next slide. Using the keywords, they then sort these uh, keywords into concepts um, by like concepts and then expand and explore other ways they might express those concepts so that once they begin researching, they uh, have a lot of alternatives in case they reach any dead ends. Next slide, please. From here, they take the concept chart and develop queries using their Boolean operators. Uh, then they practice just applying three queries to three different databases, and they're, they simply observe the results. How do the results differ? Noting those different source types that come up for each query and database and the numbers. And then from this, they choose what they feel is the best combination between a query and a database, or maybe they make up something completely new if none of them worked, in order to find their articles. Next slide, please. Uh, they have to download and annotate three articles in, in relation to their research question and then present them um, in a slide. This is just one of the articles. They have to identify the citation and bibliographic information, summarize the source, and explain why or how it connects to their question. This also starts to build digital literacy skills, as you can see throughout the presentation, learning how to link and share files appropriately. Next slide, please. At this point, the students are a little overwhelmed and stressed, um, which is one of the parts of the information search process is, is that anxiety. And so we do a found poem to both relieve anxiety, add in some creativity, and allow the students to reconnect emotionally to their topics. So this is authentic research. They chose their topics for a reason, and this allows them to kind of get back to expressing that in a more personal way. Next slide, please. Finally, we have the reflections. So first the students reflect about what they learned about the topic, but in a way that this is not, um, like this isn't a synthesis project. This is just the start of research and really giving them the idea that research is not just answering a question, but discovering new information um, on which you will probably build further questions and areas of study. And then the, they yeah, also- 30 seconds yes. left, Lisa. Great. Then the uh, next reflection is about the process. So it's that metacognitive element where they really think about um, which parts of the process they enjoyed most, which were most challenging, and how can they use these skills for future research projects and to build these skills in the future. 
And all of this is verified through our uh, pre and post tests. So you can see great improvement. This was the first unit that we did um, in the spring of 2028. We replicated it again um, the next term. And you can see over and over again that we have uh, consistently that improvement in those test scores. Thank you. Janet, you're up next. Thank you so much. I am so happy to be here tonight to join you all. Um, this has been incredible listening to all the wonderful things that teacher librarians do. I happen to be a supervisor of library services, so I have the absolute joy of overseeing our team of teacher librarians. And that was after I spent 13 years as a teacher librarian at one of our local high schools down in Central Unified in Fresno, California. Next slide, please. One of the reasons that uh, I'm so passionate about what we do has been because of the success that we saw um, with only two of us in the school district. We were so fortunate that we were identified um, by the California School uh, School Board back uh, in 2012, and two of our programs were identified as Golden Bell recipients, which was a huge honor, and I think really made a huge difference for our district, recognizing the value of the role of the teacher librarians. One of our uh, programs is called Slammin' in Your Library, and it is now... It's been going since 2005. It's expanded to different schools, which you'll see on the next slide. And it became so popular that it became a yearly event, as well as athletes as readers and leaders, which is a reading program where we take high school students in to read picture books to younger students about the importance of eating right and making good, healthy choices regarding exercise. So in 2014, I had the opportunity to move into the district level. And at that point, our district felt strong enough about the work we had been doing to add three more teacher librarians now to our middle schools. So all of our secondary schools at this point had teacher librarians. There is on this slide, my friends, a very extensive list of the things that teacher librarians can do for you. Uh, will do for you, and they will make an incredible difference. We are truly the only teachers who are authorized to teach digital literacy and digital citizenship, although we know many others do, but we are credentialed to do so. We have more than 100 student athletes each year now who participate in Athletes as Readers and Leaders, and that program is also moving into our other high schools, we continue slamming. We do those now at middle schools, and we have more writing as well. All of our teacher librarians at all of our sites do collaborative lessons. They do the maker spaces, including a family maker night. We got involved in Battle of the Books. All of our sites do book clubs. We have teen author and artists, publications, book tasting. A new program a couple of years ago came out of COVID where our high school EL students read with kindergartners via Zoom. And it has become incredibly popular. During COVID, it was the students themselves that said, we need to connect with these kids. Let us use Zoom for athletes as readers and leaders. And then from that came the kinder tech buddies as well. We also have reading buddies. We work to create safe spaces for our students not just in the space itself, but in the collection that lives in all of our school libraries. To conclude, I can tell you how we knew we were being successful. When we got ready to open a new high school, one of the first jobs listed was teacher librarian. Thank you so much for letting me present tonight. Well, it's uh, been quite a showcase for everyone and uh, what, uh, Thank you, Ms. Weil, for uh, uh, your uh, summing up from the district level point of view. Uh, if any of you uh, want to see many other wonderful, wonderful uh, examples, uh, go to the previous slide, if you would, 
uh, you again, we just want to remind you that www. Uh, uh, a a, a live library. Info is a place to to listen to many many uh, other uh, uh, interviews across the nation, from Boston to uh, to the West Coast and everywhere in between. There's must be at least twenty there. And there's so many great ideas. And so, uh, next slide. So we wanted uh, to uh, to have you meet uh, some of the educators that prepare these uh, teacher librarians for their roles. And I am so happy to introduce you to Dr. Leslie Farmer. Go ahead, Leslie. Thank you, um, Dr. Lurcher. We're really happy that you folks are here and that you've had uh, the chance to see some great examples of what current California teacher librarians are doing to contribute to the achievement of your stu school students. And now we'd like to share what pre-teacher uh, librarian programs are doing to prepare already experienced classroom teachers to become highly qualified teacher librarians who add value to your school community so that your students will achieve to the extent possible we are lucky to have uh, faculty from all three of our state accredited teacher librarian programs. So we'll just briefly uh, introduce ourselves. Again, I am Dr. Leslie Farmer and I direct the teacher librarian program at California State University in Long Beach. And my colleagues. Hi, I'm Dr. Marianne Harlan and I am um, the current teacher librarian program director at San Jose State University. Hi, Al. I am Katie McNamara, the program director for Fresno Pacific University. Super. So, what we want to do is just, uh, you know, share with you some of the um, activities, the innovative learning activities that our uh, our own pre-service uh, teachers experience, so that they will be prepared in order to really make a difference, uh, so that your students will achieve. So we're just going to uh, really cover the, the state authorized functions that teacher librarians do, starting with collections. So Katie, you wanna start us off? So our students and all teacher librarians are constantly working on collection redevelopment. It's like, wait, what's that? So not only do you get your collection figured out for your students right in that moment, the, the whole, windows, mirrors, sliding glass doors, totally what Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop wants us to do. But in a few years, it changes again and then again. And like every year you're having to reevaluate, is this still credible? Has the information changed? Have the needs changed? So always looking for that and making sure that collection not only has books that supports the content that's being taught across the campus, but also books that students want to read on their own. Like, they have to want to keep reading. That's what's going to help us overcome our literacy hurdle here. Do we have the books that are going to get them excited? And yes, that's what's in the collections. And that's what we're working on too with programming and displays to get everyone that walks in like, oh my gosh, wait, we have books about this? I didn't know. Yeah, that's what we're doing here. I'm putting it in your face sometimes, like literally, like I will even have a book like at my desk. Oh, I'll just get this book. Yeah, because like going to the stack, sometimes that's too much effort, but you have to like be aware of your students to know what to put on display like that. And I think you bring up a really good point and that is being able to get the material that they really want. And so that's one of our uh, really important things is kind of like, you know, administrating, managing all those resources. I know at our, um, in our program and I know all of ours uh, do a really good job of kind of helping those uh, teacher librarians produce, you know, databases and, and um, you know, library web portals that show how you know materials are organized, uh, and, and taking in consideration, you know, what is a culturally responsive organization? Uh, how can our students who have disabilities make sure that they can access information? Students who are English language learners. So all of that, you know, really is part of that piece to make sure that you they have systematic optimum access as convenient as possible to all the materials that we have in so many different um, formats. So uh, that's absolutely uh, so important. Having a collection and having it there and having it really used. 
which brings up the point about collaboration. Um, so Katie, do you want to kind of mention about that too? love to have a co-conspirator in deciding awesome stuff. Like I would have loved to have a chief teacher librarian back in the day, but now I get to be it for other people too. So whatever teachers are thinking like, oh my goodness, I would love to do X, but I just don't have time to figure out, or I want to do X, but I'm not quite sure how that would work. Or I'd really like to do X, but I'd want to see that in practice with students first. Or, you know, I have this really great idea, but I just really need someone to like bat it off before I like unleash it in front of some unforgiving software creature things like yes all of those things that's like a big old flashing neon sign that you should reach out to your teacher librarian they really are the person that will help with all of the things like could you just imagine if every single teacher reached out to the teacher librarian like who there'd have to be 50 of me but yeah all of the things really and i think there we do okay good <laughs> I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, I mean, we do really stress the idea of relationships and building those relationships because teacher librarians have the opportunity to see everything that's happening in the school and make connections between other teachers that some may not have the time or may not be it may not be obvious. So if you're working in a um, high school, you might be separated by departments where the teacher librarian has the opportunity to see what's happening between the departments and bring those collaborations and those relationships together in the same ways. If you're working in elementary school, you might be able to do that with grade levels. And so we really do kind of emphasize this. This, this is a thing that all three of our programs lean into quite deeply. And all of the people that you heard talking tonight also lean into, I think you probably heard a number of them say, I collaborate with my teachers in order to achieve X for my students. I think and that collaboration really and co-teaching is so, so critical within all of our programs. The candidates have to show competency and not just what they can do, but they like want to do it and get excited about it before they can get their credentials. So like, yes, you will be working with willingly, excitedly to like help kids and students and sorry, that's the same, but help students and teachers to be excited about the content they get to deliver. And I think you bring up a really good point. It's like, and what, how are we going to collaborate? And that's where the piece about, you know, all the different kinds of literacy, information literacy, media literacy, digital literacy. I know you have a lot to say about that, Marianne. Yeah, one of the things that we do really really stress and focus on is the idea of multiliteracies and and the ways that literacies and the different type of literacies uh, literacy is an overarching thing, but it's not just about reading, right? It's also about the tools and the technology that you can use. It's about understanding how search and algorithms work. It's about understanding how to find and evaluate information. It's about understanding the ethics around a artificial intelligence in ways that, you know, may not be immediately apparent to people, but that librarians are finding themselves needing to constantly and consistently be on top of so that they can teach this. You have a literacy instructional coach in your school librarian. It might not specifically be about reading. It's about all of the other types of literacy that let us live and see in our world and different formats and all of these different types of things. And Katie probably can speak to some of that as well. Dr. Marianne hit on one just briefly, but I want to bring that back to the forefront because the literacies continue to grow as our world evolves. So the whole concept is that we need to prepare our students for all the literacies of the world they live in. And so right now, yes, I'm spending so much time trying to be on the front end of artificial intelligence literacy. Mm -hmm. What is it? And that's surface level. We can't stay there and we don't with anything. So not only do we figure out the, the what's so that we can get other to, others to figure out the what's. So we're figuring out like, what is it? How do we leverage it? Why is it important? How do I create with it? And then how do I share? So we have that sequence with everything. It's understanding, creation, and sharing. And that's what has to happen for true comprehension of the literacies. I think that's a really good point about the, the whole spectrum of experience. And certainly in terms of uh, technology integration, because that really is like in our wheelhouse you know, at this point. I know uh, as an example, um, our students do digital storytelling, they actually create an online uh, graphic novel that's uh, 
about a children's or young adult um, author. And that, you know, promotes, you know, uh, reading literacy for the kids. And they, because they model it, then, you know, they're able then to have those kids, you know, the K-12, you know, students, then develop their own digital storytelling. And so in the process, you know, they're engaged in reading and research, digital literacy, uh, media literacy, visual literacy, the whole package. And so that whole cross-disciplinary you know, idea and cross-literacies is, is really key. And I know you think hey, on on one more piece with that too. That's so critical. Cause while yes, all these literacies and the creation and whatnot is fun. We also have to like empower about um, the misinformation and the difference from that and malinformation and disinformation be like, wait, what aren't all those three, the same thing? No, they're not. So another reason why the schools need their teacher librarian. And I think you bring up a good point that uh, professional development of the whole school community is certainly part of our piece. And Marianne, I know you're really good at that. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I, one of the things that I'm hearing Katie talk about and what Katie has um, to bring to the table that Leslie and I don't, as she's still in the school library, but one of the emphasis is that idea of that you are lifelong learners, you are modeling lifelong learning all of the time you like and as a school librarian or sorry teacher librarian we emphasize that we emphasize the idea that this is not like you don't end when you leave our program you have to continue to learn and you have to continue to share your learning and we really emphasize the idea of like taking a position that allows you to do professional development we require our students to try and do a professional development mm -hmm. at least bare minimum propose one. And so you are actually getting, I, I said it earlier, but I'm going to reemphasize, you're getting another person on your campus that fills the role of instructional coach or literacy coach in all of those ways. So they're like kind of, you know, kind of, they, they can contribute to that. My role when I was a school librarian or teacher librarian and what I emphasize for my teacher librarian candidates is your role is to support your admin in, in building all that, that thing. And so kind of backing up what they need a lot as well as supporting your teachers. Like you're not just supporting your teachers and your students. It's a whole school community. And we wanna lean into the idea that we can provide professional development because we are modeling lifelong learning. And that reminds me of when I was a teacher librarian that I would actually um, help with a grantsmanship, you know, for administration and doing some background research for it. And I'm sure you've had uh, experiences in doing professional development too, Katie. Completely. Um, I like to call it backwards personalized PD. Okay. So again, when the, the teacher's like, well, what about blank? Or sometimes they don't know what they don't know. Like, there, there's that. So like, okay, can I just go ahead and steal your class? I want to try this concept. So you get to expose them. Like we talked about, um, or we didn't talk about it. We were exposed to the concept of breakouts early on by, by a couple of our different um, showcase people, but maybe they don't know about that. So you can like invite them in and that's what you're doing. And the teacher gets that like hands-on experience real time with their students their standards, their content, and really just being able to observe a model lesson, see what it looks like and learn all of those things. So another stage of what does that professional development look like? Um, if you're just going into a session, there's like 300 of you listening to the wah, 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 you know, and then nothing else that doesn't really work. But if you have these like smaller segments where you can see it happen, and then your teacher library, another piece of that is they get to then turn around and watch the teacher do it. And then between both of those, you're still debriefing, having the conversations, what went well, what didn't go so well, even if I'm the one doing the lesson, like, okay, what could we have done differently? What could get better? Because like we've talked about, we're still growing in our education and still learning. And if we ever came in like the teacher librarian knows everything. Now we know a lot. We had to go to school again. There's a lot we're always learning, but like, no, we still continue to learn. And having that relationship is so key. And we're there in the trenches with the teachers, the classroom teachers to like, okay, what do we need to do for our students? And I think you bring up a really good point too, Katie, in terms of like, you know, planning with them. And it's not just, you know, the lesson I should say, you know, but it's the whole, you know, school mission itself and really being, you know, strategic with, you know, having data, 
you know, driven planning. And um, I'm sure you know, in our, our program, we do uh, action research. So the students, you know, actually learn how to, you know, the, you know, the pre-service teachers, uh, librarians, learn how to do uh, critical observations, being able to collect, analyze, you know, data, you know, create action, you know, plans. And uh, Marion, I'm sure that you've got some experiences on that too with your students, right? Yeah, I mean, we always lean into the idea that you need data to support any type of claim that you're making, um, whether that's, you know, about how you're supporting reading in your school or how students improve. Dr. Lurcher mentioned earlier how students improve when they have two teachers co-teaching a lesson. Um, we are always constantly supporting that idea that you need you need the data. It can't be just the gut feeling. Like I think this happened. It actually has to have like kind of the hardcore data and and doing data driven. I, I, it's difficult to say this, but doing data driven instruction, which is you know, it's going to matter in the long run in terms of policy. So, mm -hmm. yep. So we really are you know part of the the whole school community, and in terms of so many different ways that uh, we make a difference. And what is it for? It's because we want to make sure that your students, you know, achieve to the greatest amount, you know, possible, and that your school's mission to that effect can really take place in the library. And quite frankly, we're all over the buildings. <laughs> and that's what our students expect. And that's what you can expect, you know, from our programs. And with that, um, I think we will get I, hopefully, you know, you're excited about it. Know that there's, you know, folks out there. And we suggest get your very best classroom teacher. They're probably the best uh, ones to become teacher librarians. Well, thank you. Thank you, super educators. So uh, uh, we thought we'd wind up this uh, with with an interview of an actual uh, uh person that's actually in, in a program. Uh, uh, and we have Kendra Rose with us uh, this, uh, this afternoon, and I'm just going to ask her a couple of questions. And Kendra, uh, uh, introduce yourself and your school. Yeah. Um, hi, thank you for having me. This has been so amazing and inspiring. Uh, I am a teacher librarian at Terra Linda High School in San Rafael, California. I was and, uh, how did you get, how did you get from, uh, talk about your experience, what you've done across the years? Uh, yeah, I was um, an English teacher um, here at the same high school, Tara Linda, for 12 years. I taught all different levels of English. Um, and I was, I went to another district for one year and that district had a teacher librarian um, at the school that I was at. And I had never heard of a teacher librarian before. I had never been able to work with one, but as an English teacher, working with her was such a great experience. And I knew immediately that that is what I wanted to do. Um, I had been an instructional coach as well for about three years. Um, and I, I, I reached out to my old district, my original district, and kind of proposed this idea because they didn't have a librarian or a teacher librarian. Um, and my old principal was really interested and she made it happen and created that position for me. Um, so I transitioned from English teacher and instructional coach into this role of teacher librarian last year. Um, I was able, I was the only one in the district last year, um, but was able to, I think, make enough of an impact that this year um, we actually, our district hired uh, an elementary li dis teacher librarian um, for the elementary district and another um, high school librarian for our neighboring high school. So uh, this is very different than an, being an instructional coach because you're much deeper into all kinds of learning and, and that sort of thing. So uh, what do you see in the future, uh, your future, as well as uh, uh, being a teacher librarian uh, role change? Um, I actually think that I'm able to do more coaching as a teacher librarian than I ever was as an instructional coach. Um, I think often there was a bit of a barrier between me as a coach and teachers. There's sort of a 
a perception that you're judging or evaluative in some way when you have the title of instructional coach. And as a teacher librarian, I've had like really authentic collaborations with teachers. I'm lucky to teach, to be working at a school where I taught. So I know the teachers and I have those relationships with them. And I'm doing really interesting, like co-taught lessons. And I'm not just watching them and telling them what they should be doing. I'm doing it with them, um, modeling and kind of like, you know, in the classroom with them. And I think that that's been so much more effective as far as like actually changing teachers' ideas and practices um, than I ever could be as, as a sort of traditional instructional coach. Well, that's absolutely wonderful, Kendra. We wish you a great career. Do exactly what you're doing. Keep improving and working. And thank you so much for being a great student and uh, like so many others in our programs. And so that ends our, our program tonight, except uh, Dr. Chow, I think, would like to uh, say good evening to you. I just want to say, again, thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank all of our speakers and panelists for and reaffirming how essential school libraries are. Um, let's give them all a round of applause for their time and efforts, especially uh, uh, Dr. Leutcher for organizing this. Uh, you honor us with uh, bringing such expertise uh, to the table. Uh, just wanna, I guess, final thoughts. All children deserve access to high quality reading material. And clearly what you heard tonight uh, just reaffirms how essential school libraries are and how much of a core component and driver of innovation and building community that they are for schools and teaching and learning. Um, the reading material access to digital literacy skills, um, preparing teachers for advanced technology and also digital literacy skills to both enhance teaching and learning and also teaching the needed information literacy and privacy skills that students are going to need to flourish and protect themselves with the onset of AI and virtual mixed and augmented realities. Uh, again, I wanna thank all the teacher librarians, all the distinguished speakers for sharing their amazing work and expertise and wisdom with us tonight. Uh, all slides and recordings will be made available approximately two weeks um, at the Sky School website, as well as probably David through Alive as well. Yes, uh, they, uh, everyone Everyone will get a, uh, a notice when the recordings are available and uh, share them with your friends, uh, et cetera, and other board members and administrators. And, and uh, uh, we hope you enjoy uh, all of the resources that are available to you on those. Thank you, David. I just want to reaffirm those will be fully transcribed as well. That's also part of our commitment to sharing this knowledge and expertise. And also, must, I must thank, of course, our wonderful staff. So Alfredo Alcantar, uh, Vivian Zuo, uh, Iori Takanaga, and Nicole Perviance for all of their work in marketing and support. And also Dale David, who will be handling the post-production of our YouTube recordings. So please also keep an a eye out for the Global Library 2.0 on school libraries that we'll be hosting in the fall where many of the speakers tonight will actually have more than three minutes, actually 30 minutes worth to share their work and best practices. And again, all of that will be recorded and transcribed too. So with that being said, thanks again for your time. Uh, thanks for your community. I'm really excited. I'm sure everyone else is as well. And I bid you a great good evening.